God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. God, that we get to worship you. And God, I just pray that each one of us just gets something out of this, God, that gets something from you. God, whether it's a word, whether it's a miracle in a situation, God, we just thank you and we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Come on, let me dance. With this heart, with this heart, open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. He's giving her all he's got over there. 
<laughs> Amen. together I'm holding on and I'm holding on to faith cause I know you'll make a way and I don't always understand and I don't always get to see but I will believe it I will believe it you make mountains move Giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls, and I will speak to my fear, I will preach to my doubt, but you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. Standing on your word I'm calling heaven down to earth And you will find my enemies And this will end in victory And I will believe it I will believe it, yeah You make mountains move You make giants fall songs of praise to shake prison walls and I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt that you will fear Jesus, 
Lord, we just thank you that you're so faithful. God, yesterday, today, forever. God, we just wanna worship you in this place. God, we wanna hear from you. Lord, we just pray that you would do a good work. God, we know you're here, you showed up, and God, we just expect that you're gonna do something, Lord. God, we know that, that God, that you're a healing God, and God, that you care about each situation that walked in this room this morning. God, and I pray that you would just unleash a miracle where there needs to be a miracle. God, that you would increase faith where there needs to be faith. And Lord, we just pray that above all, that people would get recharged this morning, God, and that they would be able to go out and God, and live for you. God, we just thank you for what you're gonna do in this house and everything that's going forward in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You guys may be seated. Well, church, we're back together again. Isn't that great? Yeah. There you go. You're allowed to be happy about that. Don't, don't be shy. It's all good. Um, sometimes we just get a little subdued. You're so out of, out of practice of praising and clapping and, and cheering on the Lord. I want you to know you can do that here. So don't, don't be shy this morning. Um, I have a little sticky note here to remind me of something special later, but I'll talk about that at the end of today's message. Um, today's message, uh, I titled Lead with Love. Lead with love. It sounds really soft and gentle. I want you to know by the end of today, I, I'm sure that you will find that it is not. I hope to, to fire a dart straight into the center of your heart this morning that will, will divide that bone and marrow, that will separate things and, and, and spur you on to love and good works because we are called to lead with love, but not, like I say, not the, the frilly, soft stuff. Uh, I think true love uh, inspires people. I think true love that comes from God lifts people up. I think true love um, helps people see when, when they may be missing the mark and helps get them back on track. If a parent loves their child, they, they don't let them continue to do things that will harm them. They try to correct them. And so it's the same thing with us as believers today. We are called to lead with love. Why? Because Jesus led with love. God the Father has led with with love and continues to do that this day, to this day. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Our, our text will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll have it on the screens, but if you have your Bible, feel free to open it up or uh, turn it on, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Here's the big idea, though, for today. The big idea is this. Honest, life-changing faith compels us to lead by example because of our love for Jesus. And I, and I like to highlight a couple of key words in that statement. Honest, an example, and because. Why? Because we keep that statement on the screen, please. I want everybody to see it. There we go. I think that we need to get back to being honest. And you'll see that in one of our points today about practical steps. We need to have honest life change. We, we need to, to really search our own hearts, search our own minds, and we need to be honest. And, and real faith changes us. If, if you say you have faith, but you sin just as much when you leave the walls here today as somebody who, do, who doesn't know Jesus, I would hazard a guess that maybe you haven't had a life-changing experience with Jesus. We'll get to that in a minute. I'll explain that. And then the other thing is example. Because who here wants to be led by somebody who won't live it? Who here likes the generals or the bosses that leave from the back room and never talk to anybody, never get out and check what's going on with, with, their, with their team? We're all called to lead from the front, the front of the line. In the old days when, when you know, France and England would go to war, they would line up and they would march towards one another before there was a lot of uh, mechanical technology. We're called to lead from the front. We're called to lead with love. And love means you're willing to take the bullet for your friend. And I, and I think in our, in our society right now, with everything that's going on, would, would anybody agree that there's some problems going on? Would, I, would that be an, a true statement? Or is, there, is everything just really easy going out there in the world right now? If anybody's turned on the news in the last two weeks, would we, would we get the impression that everything is very peaceful right now? Nobody even wants to answer that. No, we wouldn't. We would find out that it's really in, in a little upheaval right now. I want you to know, friends, that, that if we're a lead for, with love, sometimes we're going to have to take a bullet. Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. So why are churches always trying to make everybody love them? 
We're not called to be loved. Jesus is called to be loved. We're called to love God the Father with everything that is made up of us, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And, and then when we start to do that, then we can start to lead with love because that's what Jesus did. Jesus led with love all the way to the cross. His, his whole three-year ministry was a, a ministry of love that led to death. But three days later, he walked out of that grave and nothing hold, held him back. Death couldn't even hold him. That's how powerful Jesus is. It is confirmed by secular um, historians. It is confirmed by witnesses of the past, both biblical and non-biblical. We know that Jesus came back to life and sin was defeated that very day. It was taken down. And so friends, you are not going to, to lose this battle if you go in with Jesus leading you. And so the other word I wanted to highlight was because we, if we have honest life change that compels us to lead by example, and we're going to be examples of what the love of God can be, then it has to be because of something, and it's because of the Savior. Not because you're really good, although i got to say, you're a good-looking crowd. You're the best-looking crowd I've seen all day. No, the other crowd was good too. Honestly, it, it, is, just, it is so good to lead by example because Jesus is good. And you have a reason to get up in the morning. And so honest life change will compel us to lead with love. So let's look at our text today. Verse 19. Oh, sorry. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Oh, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV today. You can follow along. <clears throat> We're going to stop a couple of spots here. And he says this. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Let's camp there for a second on the word slave. That's a hot button word right now in culture. Riots are going because of the word slave. Sean's, everybody's thinking, oh, Sean's going political. No, I'm not. But everything that affects our life is political. Just like everything that affects our life is spiritual. Just like everything that affects our life is physical. It, it all has an effect. So we as the church can pull away from it and be shy and not put our voice to it, or we can put our voice to it. So let's put our voice to it. This is so relevant. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Paul the Apostle said, hey, listen, if you want true freedom, slavery is where you're going to find it. Because slavery to Jesus is freedom. Because when you become a slave to Jesus, you no longer are a slave to the sin that used to make you do things that you, you regretted later. It never left you in blindness and foolishness. It, 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 the, the slavery to Jesus is a freedom. And so we need to address that. And he says, that, I become a slave to everyone. In other words, to win as many as possible, he goes on to say. The whole reason I become a slave to everyone is to win as many as possible. We have forgotten as a church, and I don't mean well, just Alexis Park. I'm talking about the church. We are called to take the ground. And I'm going I'm to expand on that in just a minute. But he said, I want to win as many as possible. Verse 20, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. I'm going to come back to the word like. You're going to see it a couple more times here. So to, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, Verse 21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those who do not have the law. And verse 22, he says, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. Uh, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. And he, he finishes this thought off by saying this, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. The gospel is called the good news. There's a lot of good news in Christ. There's a lot of good news in the Bible. There's a lot of good news in salvation. But for the sake of the gospel, he became a slave so he could win a few to Jesus. Why? Because his passion is this. He was so radically transformed that it impacted him to the point where he dedicated his entire life to show others who don't know this hope what the hope of Jesus is all about. 
And so what do we do? We become, the churches become weak over the last many years. We become watered down. We become a little bland. But we are called to be full of flavor. We talked about that last week. He says, I become like a Jew. I become like somebody under the law. I become like somebody who doesn't have the law. Why is that word like important? When you read your Bible, don't just gloss through things. You see little connection words like that. They're important. He was Jewish, but he says, I became, that's good, keep that on there, I became like a Jew to win them. In other words, he didn't go back to doing all the things Jewish people did. He wanted to win them to Jesus, the better way. And then he, and he goes on, the law, like the Pharisees, he says, like, I become like them. In other words, I, I'm around them. I know their languages. I know their, their insider information. I know the things that make them tick. So I'm like them, but I have Jesus. And so I become like them so I can get close to them, so I can show them the hope. I can lead them with love to the cross that will set them free. So he become like them. And, and then the law, there is an important part there. He says, um, I am not under the law. Um, some people, and I've heard <clears throat> some big name pe- preachers on, on, on media, social media and online, say the law is, is dead. I, uh, the law has been, is over with. I want you to know the law in the Old Testament still applies right now. Some of you are like, what? Yeah, it does. Everything about the old law applies right now. That would mean, ladies, certain times of the year, you're not allowed to be here because the law requirements. Don't not talk about me, just nobody panic. Guys, that would mean you would have to do certain things before you could come here. That would mean that we're not allowed to eat certain things. That would mean that we would have to go and do certain sacrifices with animals. That would mean that we would have to refrain from doing certain things at certain times. That would mean we would meet on Saturdays and not Sunday. But Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So what does that mean? That means you're no longer stuck with those old Levitical requirements, not because they're wrong, but but Jesus fulfilled them all. You don't have to do those things. But murder is still murder. Adultery is still adultery. Don't tell me you can come in here and praise Jesus today and go and have an affair tomorrow and expect that you're going to to show up and and enjoy eternity in the presence of God. It's not going to happen. See, that leads us to this other issue of judgment. There's two kinds of judgment, one of which we should be practicing to help each other, one of which we need to refrain from, which the churches over the years have, and I've been guilty of being, or not guilty of, I've been attacked with this when I was younger, um, of being judged in this way. Um, somebody saying, you're going to hell. I'm like, I didn't know that you were God. See, the word of God is very clear. Don't sit in the throne room of judgment. So there are two different kinds of judgment. Judgment that says, I know your eternal destination and I am, I am condemning you to that. That's God's job. Nobody, including me in this room, has any right to say that. I don't have a right to judge where your eternal destination is. That's God's job. In fact, the scripture says, how you judge others, it will be judged back to you. So be very, very careful. But we get so afraid of people saying, don't judge me. I'm like, I don't have to judge you. Your whole actions are proving what, what, what you're doing. And this is the second judgment. We are called to train, to teach, to correct, to rebuke in righteousness, in love. So if you have a friend that, you know, just cuss somebody out, you as their friend and a believer, fellow believer, you need to tell them, you know what, that, that's not good. You, you need to make that right. That, that, that's a gentle rebuke. So you're trying to restore them. You're not trying to condemn them. You're trying to, to, trying to correct the, 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 the correction of their course that they're making. You know, if you see somebody who's not serving anymore and they're becoming divisive in church or they don't want to get involved and they don't want to tithe and they don't want to, they don't want to deny themselves, you as a friend come alongside and say, no, 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 that's not healthy. You know, you, you don't have to do that. And you correct them and you show them through scripture and through love that, no, no, that's not the better way. That, see, that's leading with love. So that's what Paul is saying. I am not under the law, yet the next thing he says, I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, which is the fulfillment of the old covenant. So we need to understand that the law is still good. All those laws that were laid out, those were good. But Jesus is even better because we can't do them all. Is anybody able to carry out every 
requirement perfectly and never make a mistake in this room? Nobody's putting up their hand. God bless you. There's always that wise guy who says, oh yeah, I never do anything wrong. And you're like, um, I hope lightning doesn't strike you. But it's true, you know, like none of us do things perfectly. We're not able to do the law. It's just, it's so perfect and we're so imperfect. But Jesus did it. He was the only one to do it. And so by doing that, he led with love. He showed us the better way and he made a pathway for us to reconciliation with God. See, when you come to Jesus, you need to turn away from sin. And you don't hear that preached very much anymore, do you? Oh, just be a good person. Paul was a murderer. Paul the Apostle. He had to have a Damascus Road experience. He had to be blinded. He had to be knocked down on the ground. He had to have voices from heaven. He had to have a big extravagant thing. He had to go to to a prophet to, to pray for him and heal him. If you have to have a Damascus Road experience, your heart must be really troubled. I think that we don't need to have Damascus Road experience all the time. It depends on everybody's circumstance. But God knows what we need. But what we do need to do is we need to start being honest. We cannot say that we love God and then we don't live for God when we leave the church. Because this, this world is needing a voice of hope. You know why everybody's rioting? It's not because of the issues. It's because there's sin in the camp of people's hearts. And, and in the church... The church, great big C, people living right now. We haven't been very helpful. Let's just be honest. You know, the 50s was a great time. It was, that's when we were a Christian nation. People didn't go to church on Sunday. They, they went to church. Churches were full all over the place. They were opening new ones all the time. And, and you could always count on there'd be a crowd, no, no doubt. But it was like a piece of fruit. It looked beautiful on the outside, but there was a ton of rotten innards. One time, I had a piece of fruit. Have you ever done this? I had a really nice piece of fruit. I don't remember what one it was. It was a long, long time ago. I was young, and I was like, oh, okay, great, and I don't like fruit ever since. It has scarred me for life, but I had this piece of fruit, and and I love fruit, and we live in a place where you can get all kinds of fruit. It's awesome. Anyways, I had this piece of fruit, and it looked amazing, and it even smelled all right, and I, I go to bite into it. And it was rotten on the inside. You know, like it was like kind of watery and brown and it had a bad taste and it was bugs in it. You know, like it was gross. And so I bit into this fruit and I'm like, oh, and ever since then I, I hate fruit. I, don't, I hardly ever eat any fruit. It's just, just, just stuck in my brain. Like I could be eating bugs. It's just gross. You know, and some of you are like, hey, that's protein. It's good for you. No, it's not. Let me tell you. I'm afraid of getting salmonella or something. But either, be that as it may, that's what church in the 50s, I think a lot, in a lot of cases, not all cases, we're not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but it had, a, it had a facade, it had a skin that looked beautiful, but there was a lot of sin going underneath. How do I know this? The 60s came along, and the world went crazy, then the 70s went hopeless, and then the 80s turned dark, and the 90s went rude, and now we're here where everybody's mad at each other and there's a little hope and everybody's trying to get their way and everybody's trying to control one another. When when people want control, it's because they don't have Jesus. Because if you were were, uh, sold out to the Lord, you'd be like Paul, you'd be a slave. And you'd be doing it out of the joy of your heart because you've been redeemed. And there's an old song, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, and we're called to be like that. You know, uh, one of the things that we need to do, we need to go back to is this, is we, we need to go back to the way Paul is. He wanted to be the slave for the sake of the gospel. It was so precious to him. And we are called to have the gospel being so precious in our soul that we would guard it with our very life. Because the flesh, this flesh, gets us into a lot of troubles. Our flesh is as much the devil as the devil himself. You are in a war. It's not the devil showing up. He's a single being. The devil didn't show up at your house and make you sin today. You did that all on your own. Whenever I make mistakes, I'm certain most of the time the devil didn't come around and go, you know, and poke me. It was me being a bit of a jerk. So what do we do when we make a mistake? We go back and we make it right. This is what's so wonderful about God. You always get a second chance. As long as you're pulling breath into your lungs and your eyes are able to open and your mind is able to turn on and you're still here on this earth, 
Jesus' love and grace is extended to you to make it right. And the world is looking for that kind of leadership. The world is looking for that kind of leader. You know, um, my, my wife, not too long ago, got a rhubarb plant from the school. And she gets this little piece of a rhubarb plant and brings it home. And I'm a farm kid. I grew up with rhubarb everywhere. And so I, I have a little bit of understanding of this. And she brings this rhubarb plant home. And she said, well, can we plant it? So I said, okay, we dug a hole and we, we put it there. And, and after a, a, a couple of days, the rhubarb plant's like, and it's all saggy, you know, like it looks like it's about to die. It's, it's all limp and it's weak. And, and, and now all of a sudden the bugs are starting to come after it and everything else. And she gets discouraged. Like she wants to have rhubarb because, you know, when rhubarb, if you take it and you make something with it, it can be full of flavor and it can be tasty and it can be wonderful. Rhubarb can also be very tart and, and hard to, to digest as well for some people. But when it's limp like this, nobody wants to eat a limp piece of rhubarb, Right? I don't know too many people want a limp piece of rhubarb. So she take, I said, here's what we'll do. We'll take it out and we'll put it into a pail and we'll repot it into new soil. We'll put it into a place that's a little away from the elements for now. We'll shelter it, get it away from the bugs and, and we'll get it the proper amount of water. And today I walked out the front door and I looked at that plant and the only shoot that is shriveled up was that original one and now all these big, beautiful branches in a matter of a couple of weeks are shooting out of it like crazy. It's huge. In fact, she posted on Snapchat, apparently. So she told me uh, before service. So if you want to see it, go to Michelle's Snapchat and you can see it. Or on Instagram, I guess. But anyways, you know, that's what happens with us. We get transplanted into this new life, and sometimes we're, 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 we try to take on too much, and we, we don't get the shelter. See, this is why church is important, why leadership is important. We need to be together. Church is more relevant right this minute than it has ever been. Because you need to be in and around people and surrounded by those that will, will, will nutri- uh, give you nutrients to your spiritual soil. They will help protect you from the attack of the bugs or, in, or sin. They, you know, they're there to help put the right amount of, of water and fertilizer on you and, and to set you up for success. We are called to, to spur one another on to love and good works. That should bring joy to our souls. But what happens is we end up being like that rhubarb plant. We get weak, and then everything starts to attack us, and then we just die. But we are not called to that. We're called to be flavorful. We're called to be fruitful. We're called to, have, to, to, to bring something good to this world. So we need to lead with love. So how do you lead with love? First off, like Paul, you're going to do that by being a slave. But I'm going to give you three ways now that you can lead with love. Because every one of you is a leader. You say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a leader. No, you're a leader. If you have one friend in your life, you're a leader. If you, if you talk to more than one person throughout your day, you're a leader. Because they're looking at you, just like you're looking at other people. What kind of a leadership would, do you want to follow? Do you want to follow a leader that is selfish and seems to not care about anybody else and makes a, does a lot of questionable decisions? Or do you want to be around a leader that builds you up? Do you want to be around somebody who points you to the Savior? Do you want to be with somebody or around somebody and follow somebody that, that elevates you or pulls you down? Most people want to be elevated. They want to be better than when they came in. Well, friends, that's the kind of leader we're called to be because if you have one friend in your life, they're looking to you for support. I have learned a long time ago that if you have one true friend in your lifetime, you have found the richest gift possible outside of Jesus I'm talking about. And if you find two or three friends that, that, that will, will back your play and, 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 and not just back you up, but also hold you accountable and, and care for you like that, do you even two or three, you're, you're among the 1% of the richest people in the world. See, riches isn't the money you have. It isn't the, the size of your house. It isn't how many cars and, and toys you have. Richness is the fullness of salvation running out of your soul and the amount of good people that God puts around your life to build you up. And point you to the king. And so we, we're all called to be leaders. And we're all called to do it with love. But love, love isn't just that soft, makes you feel good. Oh, that's okay that you sinned like that. It's just, you know, don't sin like that anymore. A, a true leadership of love says, no, that's not, that's not healthy, friend. And here's why. How, what can I do to help you? A, a, true, a true friend, a true leader leads in love, doesn't look at them and, and say, it's okay to sin like that. It says, that's not acceptable and I'll help you get out of it. There is nothing better than somebody who doesn't, doesn't point at you, but they say, how can I help you? 
This is why we're, we're redoing everything and now. COVID has given us opportunity to reserve. I, I hope that everybody that's involved with this church starts to get involved and serve, even if it's only a little bit here. But then when you leave, you take that ability to serve and put it out into your community. This city of Vernon, I would love to see come alive with the hope of Christ. Amen. That we, us, the priesthood of believers would get outside of these walls during the week and we would do like Paul. We would be like them, but we would be a slave to Jesus and that we would do this for the sake of the good news that we would share in the blessings of Christ. And when people start to see that kind of hope, we will make a difference. We are called to take a ground because like that rhubarb plant, you know what happens when you plant a rhubarb plant and it gets healthy? It just, it expands. I, I remember seeing rhubarb patches that would take up entire chunks. Like It's crazy how b- fast and how big they can grow. We were called to take the ground, friends. We were not called to come to church and have a nice little gospel sing song. We were not called to come to church and be patted on the head and told something we want to hear like itchy ears. We were called to spur one another on to love and good works. And spurs, as we learned last week, don't always feel good. But they sure drive us in the right direction. And they sure help us feel stronger than when we came in. And though, even though those muscles may be a little sore because we worked them out and we stretched them spiritually, we, we feel stronger the next day. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to take the ground. You are called to take the ground. So let's take the ground in Vernon. Nobody's with me. Let's take the ground in Vernon. Yeah, how do we do that? We're going to do three things. First one is this. Be authentic about our faith journey. Be authentic about our faith journey. There is nothing more beautiful than somebody who is authentic. And, and our journey should be proof of, of the goodness of God. And people shouldn't see, look, oh, you, everything, you, know, you just know how to do that. You're strong. You can do that. No, you didn't see that I cried myself to sleep last night. No, no, you didn't see that I had to go to the cancer ward for my loved one. No, no, you didn't see that I lost my job because I refused to do something illegal. No, 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 you didn't, you didn't see that a friend betrayed me because I wouldn't do that. You, you didn't see the hurt that I have. See, people need to know that we have scars. People need to know that, that life hurts. But it, when you have Jesus, even though you have tears coming down your face, even though your heart is, feels broken, your soul is alive because Jesus is carrying it along to the Holy Spirit. Be authentic. When you're happy, yeah, I'm happy. Jesus helped me through this. God was with me. The Holy Spirit guided me, and, and I, I made it through. But you didn't see how hard this journey was to get here today. All you saw is this little second. You didn't see the five years it took me to get here. You didn't see the five years of rehab it took me before I finally kicked the habit. And now I'm free from that thing because Jesus used that, that program to work through me. And now I am free. And he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. See, friends, we need to be authentic. Don't hide the problems that we have. Don't cover up the scars. Say, you know what? That scar is a reminder that Jesus got me through. That broken heart was a reminder that Jesus can mend even a broken heart. You know, that, 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 that disappointment in my life is a reminder that Jesus made a new path when that path ended. Friends, let's be authentic about our faith with people. An authentic believer does not deny their struggle. They acknowledge their need of the Savior. Simple as that. We don't deny our struggles. We just acknowledge that we need Jesus. I don't mind that people say, oh, you need that crutch. Yeah, I do. And when necessary, I take that crutch, I turn it, and I beat the sin that's trying to come at me. I beat the temptation with it because Jesus is carrying me along. Friends, that's the kind of hope that we have. When we come to Jesus, we are free, and we can make giants fall. We can come out of of the death, hell, and the grave because Jesus did it for us. Let's be authentic. Ephesians 4.15 says, Instead of speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, and that is Christ. So speak the truth in love. If you're going to lead with love, you've got to be authentic. And we grow. Like that little rhubarb plant was just a little tiny thing with one big gross leaf that was dead. And now it's got all kinds of new leaves ready to be eaten and nourished for somebody who wants to have it in a pie. Rhubarb pie. Anybody wants to make some? Let me know. Make sure you drop one off at the house. Rhubarb pie. Yeah, rhubarb pie. That's right. You know, and so we, we need to grow. And, and I think we forget that. Like, 
faith is a growth journey. From the day you accept Jesus until the day that you take your last breath, you're growing. Your soul is growing. And it's not complete until you're in the presence of God in heaven. But we're so focused on heaven sometimes that we forget that we have a life to live. And in your play, serve Jesus. In your work, serve Jesus. In your learning, serve Jesus. In your rest, serve Jesus for the sake of the gospel and its blessings. Be authentic to the people around you. Lead with love. Number two, love people like God does. I, this, this is self-explanatory. Love people like God does. How do we know God loves? Jesus. When we were still sinners, Christ died. Jesus spent three and a half, just a little over three years, three and a half years, walking this earth, ministering to people who hated him. And he won so many and started the birth of the church. Lead like, love people like God does. God sent Christ even while we were enemies. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. If you don't love people, you, you got a problem. You know, I, I'm not, I, the, the people that call, call me a bigot or call me this or call me that or call me stupid or call me dumb, we actually had a negative comment on our Facebook just before service, and it was funny. You know, to talk about our fake God and all that stuff. And Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. So don't get all weirded out by it. We're going to be hated. I'm all right with that. That's all right. I don't mind. Jesus didn't mind it. Why should we? He spent three and a half years loving on people who didn't like him. But he won a few and started a revival of souls that has spread to the Gentile world, which is us who aren't Jewish. And we have been redeemed. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Jack Heil says, Love is the doorway through which the human soul passes from selfishness to service. And we are called to serve. You know, maybe, maybe we don't like the word slave, but we are called to serve. And it's the same thing, basically. We are called to serve. And when you love on people, you say, you know what? I'll, I'll open doors. I'll, I'll go and stack chairs after service. I'll play a, an instrument. I'll, I'll, I'll go and do a Bible study. Or I'll open my home for a, a study. Uh, I'll go out and, and talk to my neighbor. I'll be an example to my neighbor. And I'll invite them over and, and, and I'll tra- start working on them because I love them. Even if they'll never love me back because Jesus loves them. And I'm doing this because Jesus is in me. Love people like God does. And the third one is very simple. It's so simple, it's almost, you'd almost think I'm crazy, but be a friend. You want to lead with love? Be a friend. There's so few friends in this world right now. Everybody wants to be right. Everybody wants to yell at each other. Everybody's outraged at at something. Everybody wants to accuse somebody of something. And everybody wants to have somebody uh, pay them back for a wrong that was committed. We all committed the wrong. The sin is in us. Jesus takes the sin away forever. So let's stop doing things the way the world does it. And let's do things the way Jesus does it. Let's be a friend. Greater love uh, has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends in John 15, 13. There is no greater gift than he that would lay down his, lo- uh, his life for his friends. And a lot of times you don't need to take a bullet for somebody physically. You just need to die to this fleshly thing. We just got to die to our selfishness. It's, it, you know what? I said in the last service, I'll say it this one. Um, if somebody says, you know what? I want to go to church, but I don't have a car and I'm poor and I can't do it. And you say, I'll take you to church. And then three months later, you're like, this is costing me money. And it's costing me time and it's a burden. That's the flesh speaking up. When the Spirit speaks up, you say, you know what? I'll drive you to church for the rest of your life if I have to, if it keeps you close to Jesus. I will bring my non-believing friend who makes fun of me in the church after we're done the service because God is trying to reach him or her and he wants them for his own. And I will take the, 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 the jokes. I will take the insults. I will take the smearings. I will take the insults because the gospel and the sake of it and his blessings are worth it. And I want to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother like Jesus did. So we can empower people to take steps of faith in Jesus simply because of our influence as a friend. I'm going to leave you with this, this final thought. We're going to close the prayer. We talked about fruit a lot today. We talked about rhubarb and things like that. We are called to be delicious nutritious and sweet not rotten angry and bitter 
Jesus has paved the, the way for us through the cross. He's given us everything we need. So let's be delicious, nutritious, and sweet to the world around us. Let's bring them to church. Let's be the church in their homes and in their neighborhoods and in the workplaces and in the schools. Let's be Jesus to them for the sake of the gospel that we may share in his blessings because we lead with love. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that we would be people that are determined to lead with love, not because we're perfect, but because you are perfect in us. And that each and every day we're getting a little bit closer to you. We're getting, a, our ears are getting a little more tuned to your voice. Our hearts are getting a little more soft to your call. And that God, that we are trying to raise up and spur one another on to love and good works. That we wanna, we wanna help, see, uh, help people see the truth of Christ and come to the saving knowledge of him. And so today, Lord God, maybe we've been, a little, we've been a little timid in our faith, but you have called us to take the ground. And so, Lord God, I pray that every person in this room would be determined in their heart and now start to take the ground that, that you have put in front of us. We don't need to worry about going across the world. All we gotta do is take a little ground in our own sphere of influence. And so, Lord, I pray today that we would uh, lead with love, that we would serve those around us, that we would become a slave for the gospel and for the lost and for our friends. So Lord, I pray your blessings on each and every one here that we would live to leave today being reminded to be authentic, to love people like you do, and to be a friend. We commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, it's, we're going to close in just a minute, but we're going to close with a song. Why don't you stand as we sing it? And remember when you leave today to be delicious, nutritious, and sweet while you leave with love. <laughs>